On this episode of Urban U, when the astronauts of NASA's mission Artemis 3 land on the moon, the work of CUNY students will be helping them. A City College student helps bring seasonal harvest to the local community. And from food in East New York to food for thought in Park Slope, a new coffee shop owned by a Queens College alum offers a space that promotes community activism and inclusion. That and more CUNY stories, including a sit-down with former CUNY professor, jazz legend, Ron Carter. Welcome to Urban U. Three, two, one, boosters in ignition, and liftoff of Artemis One. NASA's first Artemis flight in November 22 was unmanned as it orbited the moon. The second Artemis flight will also orbit the moon, but with astronauts aboard. When Artemis III takes people to land on the moon for the first time since 1972, the work of CUNY students will be helping them. We have an RF controller, so this is how the board communicates with different boards or the actual lunar lander that will be on the moon. Here is the three data, the X, Y, and Z, the three data points that we have from the accelerometer. These tiny electronic boards are called Lunasats. They weigh about five grams and are solar powered. They are equipped with a whole bunch of uh, devices so that we on our team can program them to do different scientific experiments. These students from various CUNY colleges are part of a global project called GLEE, Great Lunar Expedition for Everyone. The idea is that hundreds of lunasats will be deployed to the surface of the moon. Student scientists are programming them to collect data to help the astronauts NASA is sending to the moon's south pole. These tiny devices, these lunasats, are bringing people all over the world together in support of the Artemis missions and exploration of the moon. In fact, this is a worldwide effort trying to include many uh, different countries and, and student groups from everywhere. But here at the American Museum of Natural History, we're sponsoring a group of CUNY students, and we are very much in the middle of designing experiments that will go uh, in the vanguard to human exploration of the moon. Hunter College professor Dennis Robbins says after enjoying a previous class, the students themselves found this project so they could keep working together as a team. The project is organized out of the University of Colorado and funded by NASA's Artemis Student Challenge Initiative. Each team received a kit with all the required materials, including lunasats they can work with as they design code. Jake Postioni and Leonis Feliciano say the lunasats can be programmed to test for water on the moon and other info that will help the astronauts. And so while this is on the lunar surface, the dust and everything that comes in contact with it, uh, you can measure you know, roughly how much water content is inside of that. And the accelerometer can tell us whether there are moon quakes. You mean like earthquakes, but on the moon? Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that would be helpful for the astronauts. Yeah, exactly. And NASA is worried about other issues like meteorites. They're really interested in the level of micrometeorite impact, because that would have wear down, you know, spacecraft materials, space suit materials. Using marbles uh, to substitute as the micrometeor impact, and we would throw them near to see and to model as if they were little asteroids hitting the moon. Uh, and we can see how the acceleration in these different directions change as we do that. They're amazingly creative. They are wonderful collaborative problem solvers, and they have a wonderful sense of humor. That's for sure. In the computer world, people have been known to put little private messages into their code, often called Easter eggs. And this group can keep a secret. Rumor has it, rumor has it that the code for this includes some names, maybe CUNY, maybe American mm. Museum of Natural mm. History. Mm. 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 Got to go on. Interesting. Yeah. They like to have fun, but they're also serious about the work. The whole point of um, Artemis is so that man can learn more about the moon so that we can become an interplanetary species uh, further down the line. And so being able to be a part of the generation that gets to either complete code for the Artemis missions or build out engineering devices and solve problems that NASA needs to solve to get us on the moon, it's, I think a lot of people are going to feel accomplished and feel like kind of connected by that. I'm Donna Hanover for Urban U.
When I got to New York, August of 1959, uh, I went down to the heartbeat of the city. At that time, it was 52nd Street, Broadway. And there was a Birdland uptown. There was a place on 132nd called Wells. Jazz all over New York, especially uptown. It was a great time to be here. New York City, known for a lot of things, including this thriving jazz scene. In the 1960s, bebop jazz was all the craze. Jazz from downtown to uptown. Cats dressed to the nines in smoke-filled clubs, playing what jazz pianist Billy Taylor calls America's classical music. What rose out of this scene were a lot of legends, some of them still living. Introducing three-time Grammy Award-winning bassist, Ron Carter. I've been a student all my life on how the bass operates, and I get better at understanding it as I've gotten older. What made Ron unique was his ability to bring the bass to the forefront in a genre dominated by horned instruments. I understand the power of the instrument. I understand how it, my note choices influence this environment that I'm in right now. I think the other thing is that I, 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 have, I hear sounds in my ears and these guys I'm playing with are the kind of guys who want to be as curious as I am as to what this note means, the tempo of this tune, just the right key, that kind of detail. And once the bass player makes that kind of commitment to the music, and the band grows like this because now there's an important factor coming from this guy who's no longer behind the palm tree. That same unyielding commitment to the music led him to one of the biggest highlights of his career. In 1963, he was requested personally by Miles Davis to play bass in his second great quintet. One of the things I'm always asked is, uh, what was it like playing with that Miles Davis band? I don't treat that as an experience. It's always a, a going to school free. I'm going to school with Miles, I'm going to school with Herbie, I'm going to school with Tony, I'm going to school with Wayne. And I get a chance to play with these teachers every, every night, and they are freely sharing information with me. His bass lines appear in over 2,200 recordings, making him the most recorded bassist in jazz history, with his bass contributing to songs like Roberta Flack's Killing Me Softly, Freddie Hubbard's Red Clay, and a tribe called Quest's Excursions and Bugging Out. Ron says that without the bass, you don't know what the harmony is. I've seen groups and I've heard them play and I've enjoyed their efforts. And the first thing to get canceled, the bass player. I think uh, those groups, while interesting for the first three minutes, kind of lose their emphasis after the, for the next five minutes because there's not a harmonic direction that's as audible and as present as the bass player can provide for those size ensembles. And his bass has been the harmonic direction that has spanned over six decades for the likes of Gil Scott Heron, Billy Joel, Paul Desmond, Quincy Jones, Paul Simon, Chick Corea, Aretha Franklin, Bette Midler, and countless others. Back in May, Ron was fated at Carnegie Hall in a one-night-only celebration for his 85th birthday as he performed select material from his catalog. I just had to ask him, at 85, what keeps him driven? I'm determined that there's a set of notes that I haven't found yet. I've had this curiosity of what makes music from the bottom up more effective based on my note choices. And I can't find that out in my house. Ron is still on the move, constantly touring and performing, continuing his legacy, plucking and strumming away for that set of missing notes. This is Eddie Bailey for Urban U. Most of what we have here on the farm, we have a lot of culturally relevant produce. So we have long beans, we have billet melon, we have okra, we have kalaloo, um, we have Malabar spinach or Guyanese kalaloo. We have different varieties of peppers, like hot peppers and seasoned peppers. 
At the age of 14, um, I started out as a youth intern with an organization called Green Gorillas as a summer youth tiller. And then right after um, that, my high school at the time, Academy for Environmental Leadership, they decided to have a farm on the school property. So they created like a summer youth internship program out of that. And that just got me inspired and connected to uh, Food Justice. Food Justice is a movement um, that focuses around environmental justice, environmental sustainability, and urban agriculture. The basis of Food Justice is creating and growing affordable, locally cultural relevant produce for communities that need it the most, um, while doing it in a sustainable way that preserves the environment. We do fresh food pantry distribution. So we have our Tuesday distributions, which are from 3.30 onward, where we harvest produce from the farm and we distribute it to the community members. East New York has a high population of African Americans and especially Black people from the Caribbean. They see us harvest on Tuesdays and they know where it's coming from. And because they could see us doing the work, they trust what they're eating a lot more and that's important to us. And we take feedback from the community as well and put it into action on the farm. My role as a co-project director is to make sure all the operation of the project goes by smoothly. So I oversee nine staff, full-time and part-time. Um, each staff person have their roles and responsibility to the project. And I just make sure that everything, um, everyone meet their milestones, their goals, and making sure that the project is being facilitated appropriately. Yeah, and I do a lot of grant writing, a lot of networking, community outreach. We hire 30 to 40 youth interns um, for a nine month paid internship program. We have two farms and two community gardens that we operate and manage, and each of them have their own specific uh, role in the project. We also help community gardeners with community garden assistance. We offer mini grants to community gardeners and residents who are doing anything that's urban ag related or food justice related in the community. We also have farmers markets in East New York. So we have free farmers markets on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays at different areas in East New York. When I used to live in East New York, I had a backyard, which was great. And my landlord, she had garden beds there. So we grew together, we grew food together. And what I love and appreciate is just knowing that I could go in my backyard and harvest and just make a meal out of whatever I'm growing. As much as this work is physical and mental labor, um, when you're touching the ground, when you're watering the plants, it brings a different sense of peace. and. Your mind is more focused on what do I need to get done on the farm or in the garden rather than let me go reply to this email, let me plan this event, um, let me troubleshoot this issue. Um, it brings a sense of serenity. Hi, I'm Nora Wesson and I'm studying journalism in my senior year at Hunter College. Here's what's happening at CUNY. CUNY Chancellor announces the completion of 130 university infrastructure projects since May 2019. Black, Race, and Ethnic Studies Fellowships have been awarded to 65 CUNY faculty and PhD students. Baruch students present their own data on how climate change affects low-income New Yorkers at the British Conference of Undergrad Research. City College partners with the DMV to create license plates that celebrate school spirit. LaGuardia Community College takes over Long Island City streets with a weekly series of culturally diverse events open to the public. These are just some of the stories recently making headlines at CUNY. Stay tuned. I remember dropping to the floor because I felt so light. Um, I remember there were like tears in my eyes. Chinera Mobile got news about citizenship while at school where she worked as a teacher. Her co-workers worry and she told them. I'm going to be a U.S. citizen. And they were, they were so happy because a lot of them knew the process that I was going through. That was 2018 and Chinera Melville from Trinidad and Tobago was about to see her dream come true. I first came um, for college 
And then I decided um, that, you know, this was a land of opportunity, so I decided to stay. Shanir embarked on this journey by herself 20 years ago. And while she was finishing her degree in psychology, she attended a City University of New York Citizenship Now event. I actually love these kind of events. So they are a bit chaotic in the sense that we try to bring at least 150 people to a one-stop event. They provide legal advice and help immigrants deal with paperwork and bureaucracy. The forms can be a little bit complex. It is a lengthy process. There can be a lot of factors that are involved in any particular application. Shinir got the help, and it took two years to break through. So the night before my naturalization um, ceremony, I remember I couldn't sleep for a lot of immigrants. It was like our life had just began. For a lot of them, it was just like making sure that their families were now safe and they can file for their families. And now, she offers her help to the community. She works as a family coordinator at Coney Island Prep, volunteers at Citizenship Now, and inspires immigrants who want to make their dreams come true. I had to wait um, almost three years to get my citizenship. There is light at the end of the tunnel, and it's gonna be all worth it when you have that certificate um, in your hand. Ana Maldonado, City College News. Still up on Urban U, Brooklyn has a new coffee shop. But what makes this one stand out is its dedication to community activism. And it comes from its owner, a Queens College graduate. But first, highlights of digital storytelling from our Lehman College students. I just didn't think I was going to change with it. A classic French game is gaining new fans in Brooklyn. Welcome to the Corot Club in Industry City. Petanque is a boule sport from the south of France. Boule sport is generally any game where you're kind of throwing something at another thing. Uh, <laughs> curling, shuffleboard, bocce. A lot of the boule sports are very similar. I think one similarity between uh, billiards and petanque is that when the balls hit each other, you get that nice cracking sound, which is very satisfying. Dana Bunker and Aaron Weeks opened the Corot Club in 2020 with four outdoor courts. Then just recently, we opened up our brand new indoor space behind me. We've got nine full courts inside, a full bar and a full kitchen, 6,000 square feet. So now we're operating indoors, outdoors year round. You have a CUNY connection. I do. I spent several years uh, studying in the sociology department at the Graduate Center in the old B. Altman building. I used to walk by the studio and see you guys all the time. But back to business. There's a reason this is called the Corot Club. A Corot is when you hit your opponent's ball dead on and then your ball remains. Uh, most of the time when you're shooting out an opponent's ball, both balls go flying. But if you hit it just right and your sticks, then you have the point. Salut à toutes, salut à tous. The tank is a big deal around the world, especially in the south of France, where it was invented. These are the finals of the 2022 Coupe de France de Patanque. Petanque is a precision sport, which means it's not too strenuous athletically, but it requires a lot of hand-eye coordination in order to uh, achieve the goal. The goal is to throw the steel balls as close as possible to the target, a small, colorful ball. This here is our target ball. In Petanque, we call this the cochonnet, which means piglet in French. Now, anytime you throw the cochonnet or any of the boules, you have to have both feet inside the circle. So I'm going to toss one out. No, I didn't do it. <laughs> it's okay. All right, so I want you some beer on me. <laughs> the Corot Club is located in Industry City, a 100-year-old manufacturing complex on the waterfront in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Once known as Bush Terminal, 
The imposing, heavy industry structures have been modernized and repurposed for 21st century office, retail, dining, and recreational use. The 16 buildings of this sprawling campus also attract artists and creative types, while heated tents and furnished courtyards invite strolling and sitting. And you'd be surprised to hear that this is a huge destination over the weekend, not just in Brooklyn, but for people coming from Manhattan, from New Jersey, from all over the city. The teams get a little bit enthusiastic. It's a casual league, but some of the teams are a little serious about the casual play. Uh, we do have leagues every Monday and Tuesday nights. We've got about 120 league members uh, right now, and they play for about 10 weeks and then do a little finals. And after that, we have an award ceremony where we give out trophies. We have a lot of fun. We like to say that if you come down and play at the Corot Club, you get a little taste of the south of France in the south of Brooklyn. Barry Mitchell, Urban U. Katie Bishop's coffee shop in Brooklyn has a name with deep historical ties. The full name is Principal's GI Coffee House. GI being government issue, like GI Jane, GI Joe. And that is a social movement dating back to the 60s during the American War in Vietnam. In the late 60s, GI coffee houses were located right near military bases in the U.S. and run by disillusioned veterans, with the stated aim to protest the Vietnam War. Eventually, pressure from the military and local authorities forced most of them to close. And they operated as coffee houses. That was how they paid the bills. But they were really social gathering hubs. And they would host open mics and legal stand downs and activist meetings. These spaces were there for, for GIs to sort of blow off steam and to commiserate with other like-minded veterans. Haiti was in the Marines herself as a musician from 2007 to 2011. But afterwards, she connected with groups like Iraq Veterans Against the War and Veterans for Peace. She loved the idea of linking the activist coffee shops of the 1970s to her business that she opened in 2022. I wanted to find a space that could function as a cafe because I have years of experience being a barista, but I wanted it to be a front for a social gathering space. I want to be able to, to, to do community-centric events that are really supported by the rest of the cafe stuff. As a graduate with a master's degree from the Queens College Music Department studying bassoon, Katie learned a lot about organizing events. She's applied those skills here. The space holds art shows, readings, and is a hub for bike rides and races. There's a small bike repair station, and art by cyclists hangs on the wall. But what I've chosen to do, especially being an event space and a gathering space, is I've sort of brought all the things of life that I like enjoying here. I don't miss any of my friends because they all come and visit. I don't miss out on a lot of social events because the kinds of social events I want to attend are the types of events that I organize and put on here. Ninth Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue is a notoriously busy and dangerous road where a cyclist was killed by a box truck. That tragedy got Katie's activist wheels in motion. That led me to get in contact with uh, my city council member, and then through her, I started getting in touch with other city agencies. That turned into doing a walkthrough with a bunch of local electeds, and then, like, off the books, I was getting a bunch of people involved with, like, hey, all these politicians are going to be here. Maybe we should get a bunch of cyclists and users of the roads here as well. So that, I think, is the most like, direct and obvious activism I've done here. And so, Katie's GI Coffee House, which has pay-what-you-can coffee on the menu, is becoming a community hub for people of all kinds. I want my space to be open to everyone and putting extra focus on marginalized people of all sorts. And I have it very elaborately detailed on my website. You can come and avail yourself of my resources and not have to be a paying customer in any way. You are welcome as you are. People are allowed to just come here and hang out. For Urban U, I'm Craig Thompson.
For more episode highlights and sneak peeks into our upcoming stories, meet us on our social media platforms. Thank you for watching these stories from the largest university in the nation, the City University of New York.